Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you for a chance to gather and to look at your word this morning. And we Mm -hmm. pray that as we open up the word, Lord, that you would open up our hearts. Lord, open up our hearts and our minds. Lord, let our ears to hear and our eyes to see what you have for us this week. Yes. Lord, let us be people of prayer and encourage us, Lord, to pray. Pray for those overseas, Lord, the the orphan with the broken broken arm and the orphanage with, uh, with, with bills to pay and shortage of funds. Lord, yes, for, Lord, for everybody, Lord, who seeks the Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you would, you would, you would fill us up to overflowing. Mm-hmm. Send your Holy Spirit to minister to us, and pray that you use Pastor Izzy now to speak to each one of us now. We ask that now in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, guys. Would you turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians? To the end, we're going to be finishing up chapter 1 this morning and going into chapter 2. As we continue the thought, what Paul is writing to the Corinthian church about, he's talking to them, you remember, about that he, it was in his heart to pass by them on his way to Macedonia. He said, and this is uh, back in verse, verse 15 and 16, he said, of chapter 1, I, it, he said, I have confidence and I intended, he said, at, to come at first to you so that you might twice receive a blessing. Once, he says, that is to pass on, uh, on my way to Macedonia and then again from Macedonia to come to you by, that I might be helped, be helped on my journey to Judea. So he, you know, he's writing and telling them it was my intent. You remember, he founded this church at Corinth. So he spent 18 months as a church planter, um, establishing these believers in their faith, helping them grow. And now he's saying... It was my plan, uh, you know, uh, like the Bible says, many are the plans of a man's heart, right? But what does it say in that Proverb 16? But the Lord directs his steps. And Paul said, I had the plan to, I was going to get two blessings. I was going to see you on my way to Macedonia, passing through, and then on my way back, going to Judea, I, I get to stop a second time. That At least that was the plan. Now, how many of you have made plans and the plan didn't come out the way you planned it? Anyone ever run into this? I know that this, yeah, most of the time, <laughs> nah, it never happens, right? Always work, make the plan, work the plan, you know, p- whatever. I hear these people, plan the work, work the plan, and it all happens, and I'm like, not in my life. At least, you know, I, I have learned to say when it comes to my plans that um, these are, like James says, if you say that you're going to do something, and James said that, if you say that you're going to do such and such a thing, I'm going to go to such and such a city, engage in such and such a business, make such and such a profit, this is the plan. You know, he says, he said, and you don't say one thing. You just said it. What was it, Sue? Lord if the Lord wills, Lord willing, this is the plan. He says, if you don't do that, then all of your planning is just boastfulness. James says you're boasting in 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 the things of your own understanding, of the flesh. Oh, I'm going to do this. You know, even some, by the way, some ministers, they boast, I'm going to do this for God. And God's going, that's not what I'm going to do with you. You know, <laughs> I mean, they can have all these plans, but the Lord goes, Nick say on that one, you know. <laughs> and you can, you can push to get your plan. Has it, have you ever tried to push to get a plan done? And felt like every step was just like st- slogging through quicksand you're just not getting any traction you're not getting where you want to go and you wonder what is up with this i want to submit to you today's study might help you in that area because when james writes these things he says what you should what you should say instead of i plan to do this and 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 go to such and such a city engage in such and such a business and make such and such a problem what you need instead to say is if the lord wills If it's God's will, this is the plan that I have. Now, today I want to point out something that I see a lot of Christians struggling with today because they're they're kind of, how do I say it? They're they're almost like stuck in park. They're like, I don't know which way to go, so therefore I'm not going to move. 
And I, I mentioned to Aaron this week, you know, it's easier to steer a, a, a rolling car, a moving car, than a parked one. Have you ever tried to turn the wheels on a parked car? You know how it doesn't, you're just fighting to get the wheel to turn. Even with power steering, you can hear the wheels outside just squeaking on the, the rubber on the pavement because they're not really meant to steer when they're parked. The best time to steer a car is when it's rolling. A little bit of correction to the steering wheel and the car just follows the lead of the, you know, it's easy to steer a moving car. Well, I submit to you as Christians, the Lord, when he directs our steps, you know, sometimes Christians are like, I'm not going, I'm not going to take one step till he tells me where to go. And I'm like, how about say, Lord, here's my plan, but not my will, like Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but whose will? Thy will be done. I'll do whatever you say. Now, this isn't, today what I'm going to teach you, I gained this knowledge from reading ahead here in Corinthians. <laughs> okay, just, just to give you a little heads up, I'm not making this stuff up. I found this in the Bible by a pretty good example, Paul the Apostle, who God used to pen like half the New Testament, kind of reliable. And uh, so you're like, why would you go with that guy? Because, you know, just listen to how God steered him. You know, he didn't say, he said he didn't even go straight away into ministry. Well, he went out into the desert for 13 years and sought the Lord. Had seminary experience before he went into his missionary journey. A lot of people don't catch that little detail in the book of Acts that Paul was, Paul was one that he went and sought God and, and grew in grace. And when you read about him, you, you can tell the guy, well, he, God showed him grace. And because of that, he became one of the greatest messengers of grace, the grace of God. I am but what I am by what? By the grace of God. I get to do what I do by the grace. I, I look at it like I get to preach on a beach in Hawaii. Like, tough gig, huh? By the grace of God. But this hasn't actually been an easy gig. You know, uh, in fact, uh, and I remember when I was in Arizona, this 27 years ago, talking to a pastor named Mick Meyer, who used to be our home study, uh, Bible study leader of our, our little church, Calvary Chapel, Verde Valley. He was, he, later he would go on to become the pastor there when the, when the pastor would fall into sin and leave the church, the Lord would raise Mick up to fill his shoes. But Mick had spent a few years in Maui trying to plant a, a, a fellowship. And his word to me is, don't go. Don't go to Hawaii. It will chew you up and spit you out. It is really hard to minister the gospel there. There is so much opposition. He goes, people are, are like, well, why do we need God? We already live in paradise. You know, and to the one who doesn't sense they have any needs, it's hard to tell them you need a savior. You know, I, personally, I find that when I share the gospel with people who are poor, Jesus said, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than a camel to go through an eye of a needle. Because when you talk to a rich person, you have need of a savior. They're like, I don't need anything. Anything I want, I can buy. I got the deep pockets, it's no problem. But when you talk to a poor person, who daily has to scrape by just to get food to eat, sustenance, a place to sleep, and you say, just like you have needs for, for your daily concerns, you have spiritual needs, and, and you need a Savior. And they go, oh, I get it. They can identify with a need. Oh, I got a physical need, and you're telling me I have spiritual needs? I get it. Oh, yeah, I get it. But he said, Mick told me, don't go to Hawaii. They don't believe they have any needs. They got it all covered. They're living in paradise. They don't need anything. How are you going to tell someone you need a Savior when they're, and, and you're spiritually without Him, you're like in this world drowning in this world. You're going to die. You're going to perish if you don't come to Jesus. The lifeboat is pulling up saying, here, hop in and live, and you'll have everlasting life, but you got to get in the boat. And they're going, I'm just happy swimming. I love my life in the world. I don't need, I don't need to get in your boat, you crazy Christians. And, they, and, they, and he told me, don't go. It's a really hard place to minister. And I was like, but I feel like God's saying go. Now, one thing you should do in your Christian walk, if God tells you to do something, what should you do? Do it. I mean, this isn't even an option. You should do it. But Paul, Paul is going to give me an insight that kind of helps broaden my, how do I call it, big picture 
you know, because sometimes as Christians we get a little too narrow focused on the day or the problem or whatever, a little petty thing, the person who cut us off in traffic and the rest of our day we're consumed with that idiot. He pulled and almost hit me or, you know, and it messes up our week. But we need, well, let's look at what Paul, when he writes to this church, he kind of has this ability to pull back. And that, that's something that we sometimes need to do. To pull back and assess the situation with a little bit broader outlook. Paul intended to come to them. And apparently, well, we read this last week, that somebody must have said Paul's, a, Paul's one of those vacillating guys. He says yes, but then he doesn't do it. So his yes isn't yes, and his no isn't no. And, you know, he said he was going to come, but he didn't come. How many times have we made plans and it didn't work out? You know, I mean, r realistically in life, we, we make a plan and it doesn't always pan out the way we planned. Well, Paul, Paul says, listen, guys, don't think that with me, my yes is, is anything else than yes. And my no is anything else than no. He said, but God is a God of promises. And God, he recognized that the promises of God, verse 20, were, were in him that they were yes. Therefore, also through him, he said, is our amen to the glory of God. Our so be it. In other words, whatever it's going to be, so be it. And I know this sounds weird because we don't use the word amen in the way it's actually translated from the Greek. It means when you say amen to someone, to a prayer, you know, someone says, oh, Lord, help that person that's hurting over there. And you give the amen. Amen. Literally in Greek, you're, you're pronouncing, so be it. That's what amen translates to. So be it. May it be so. Or if you want to say it that way. It's whatever they prayed, you're saying, let that come to pass. And Paul says that the things of God, his plans, he says in him, there's, there are many promises of God, and in him they are yes. And so be it, he says, in him is our so be it to the glory of God. You know, what he says, that's what is to be. That's what he makes to be. And so Paul goes on and says, and we ended with these two verses, verses 21 and 22 last week where we pick up today. He said, so now he who establishes us with you, he says, is Christ. And he has anointed us in God. He has also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. We went over that in detail last week. Now we pick up today with verse 23 of first, Second Corinthians 1. He says, but I call God as a witness to my soul that to spare you, I did not come again to Corinth. He says, N not that we lord it over your faith, but we are workers with you for your joy. For in your faith, you are standing firm. Now, Paul says, I call God as a witness to my soul. Here's the, here's the real reason I didn't come to you. I wanted to. He, he said his, his desire was to pass twice by, to get a blessing on both, you know, both directions. He was going to pass by through there, passing through Macedonia, passing back on his way to Judea. He thought, I'm going to get double blessing. I get to stop by and see him twice. But God told him no. Now why? What was going on in Corinth that, first of all, can anyone remember back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the, the, one of the main purposes of Paul's first letter was to address a problem that was going on in the church at Corinth. Does anyone remember the problem? They, they actually had a kind of, you, you might put this down as big spiritual problem in the midst of a budding, growing church, okay? <laughs> the problem was, well, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 5. I want to show you, just so you, for those that weren't with us, those of you guys that were, you, just a quick re re reminder for you. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, he said, he wrote to them because he said it was actually reported to him that there was immorality amongst them. And immorality, he said, such as of a kind that doesn't even exist amongst the Gentiles. He said that someone has his father's wife. There was a man there who was betting his own father's wife. Paul went, you know, in the world they don't live that immorally. And yet you've got someone in your church who's doing that. He said, this is a problem. 
He said, you guys, and to the church, they were just tolerating it. Paul said, you guys, you've become arrogant. He says, and, and you've not even mourned. Instead, so that the one who has done this deed would re be removed from your midst. Paul saying, you know, when somebody is participating in sin, what's the wages of sin? Death. Death. And when someone is, is really neck deep in a sin, they might not realize it, but what, the, what they're participating in is bringing death. Now the problem is, is that that death, it, it's like cooties. <laughs> it can spread. You know, it's a weird thing. In, amongst Christians, when you have one Christian, now I'm not talking about that, that when, we ha when we as Christians sin, do, do Christians sin? Yeah, we always do. But, but Paul said that this is a sin that was being done, not as, you know, we, we might sin and say, Lord, forgive me that I, I didn't intend to do that. But this was an intentional act. This person, and it was something they were continuing in and Paul is saying, can't you guys see that this person is doing this? And you guys haven't even mourned, he said. Now, I find it interesting that he chooses the word mourn. You haven't even mourned that this person is behaving in this immoral way. Why, when do we mourn, anyway? When someone dies, right? If you see someone who's, you know, someone you love died, and, and, and we mourn that they're passing. We, we miss them. Now, that's normal. The Bible says to mourn with them that mourn. Weep with those that weep. Right? Rejoice with them that rejoice. We're, to, we're supposed to... But these guys, they see a man in sin, and they don't even... They don't even act like the sin is any problem. If you're walking in the Spirit, and you know that someone is walking in sin intentionally, hopefully your reaction is that makes you mourn. Your heart is grieved that, wow... Man, they feel bad for them. They, they don't even realize they're, they're, they're participating in spiritual death. Because that's what sin will bring. It, and don't be fooled. Sin always, always, the wages of sin is death. You want to dabble with a little bit of sin, it will bring death in your spiritual life. But Paul said that death was starting to spread amongst the believers. And they weren't even mourning about it. And he's going, you're not doing nothing. So he wrote to them, you, re you remember what he says right there in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians? He said, I am my part, though I'm absent from the body, but I'm present with you in spirit, he said. I've already judged him who's committed this as though I was present. And he said, in the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus, Paul says, I have decided to deliver such a one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. Now, your boasting, he said, is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven, leavens how much? The whole lump. He says of dough, now clean out the old leaven so that you might be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ is our Passover and has also been sacrificed. Remember, the Passover was a was a Passover, a, a partaking of a bread that was unleavened. Leavened represented sin. He says, you guys, we have Christ as our Passover. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice, nor the leaven of wickedness, but with unleavened bread, the, the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now he says, I wrote you my letter not to associate with immoral people, I did not mean the immoral people of this world or, the, or with the covetous or the swindlers or the idolaters. Paul says, for then you'd have to go out of this world. I mean, I can't tell you, don't, don't associate with immoral people because we're in this world and there's a bunch of immoral people in this world. But he says in verse 11, I actually wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he's an immoral person or a covetous person or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what do you have to do with judging outsiders, Paul said? Do you not judge those that are within the church? Now, those who are outside, God judges. And then he quotes from Deuteronomy 13.5, he says, Remove the wicked man from amongst yourselves. That's written in the Law of Moses, in the Pentateuch, in the book of Deuteronomy 
that they were to remove the wicked man from amongst themselves and be what? Four-letter word. Holy. Be separated, set apart for God's use. Be a people who are holy unto God. Now, we went over being holy, but when somebody's willfully sinning in your midst and they're arrogant about it, like, oh, I don't care, this isn't bad. God doesn't, God doesn't have any issue with me being a swindler or, or, a, <laughs> or a covetous person or a, a drunkard. I'm still a Christian. Let me in the group. I'm going to get drunk while I'm at church. I got news for you. God's not pleased. You're not to continue in that. And Paul would say, I, as if I was there in person with you, I've already, I've already made the judgment. Take that guy and put him out. Put him out. Now, did, they, did the church of Corinth put the guy out that was sleeping with his father's wife? The answer is yes. And now we come to today, to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, where we're going to read something. They did such a good job of following this part of the law of Moses. Remove the wicked man from amongst yourselves. We can follow the letter of the law. They did it so well, they missed the spirit of the law. They put the guy out, and look what Paul has to write in his second letter. He says, hmm, I determined this Verse 1 of chapter 2. This for my own sake, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. He says, for if I cause you sorrow, then who will make me glad but the one that I made sorrowful? Now this is the very thing I wrote to you. So that when I came, I would not have sorrow from those who ought not to make me rejoice. Who I'm sorry, who ought to make me rejoice. Having confidence in you, all that my joy would be the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and much anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not so that you would be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have especially for you. Paul isn't afraid to tell him he loved these people. By the way, hopefully any minister that you sit under that teaches you about God isn't afraid to tell you that he loves you. Because that's a... That, by the way, you want to be in ministry and you say, I want to be the pastor. I want to tell those people what to do. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I had one guy tell me, Pastor, you're no good at this job. You, you don't, th these people are screwed up. You need to tell them what to do. You need to straighten them out, you know. And, I, and the guy was, had the drill sergeant mentality, I call it, you know. And, I, and I'm, I'm like, um, do, you, do you look around? Do you love these people? I don't care about them. They're messed up. You, you're a terrible pastor. And I, I realized, you're, you're, you're a man with a terrible heart. Because Jesus said to Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yeah, I love you, Lord. He said, then what? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Tend my sheep. Do you love me? Shepherd my flock. Look after them. And you know, the, the one qualification of a good pastor is that he loves the flock that God puts him in, over. That he, and Paul said it. We're not here to lord over you. We're not here. We're just workers with you for your joy. Is the person who's pastoring you helping work with you in your faith for your joy to grow? Helping you to grow. Paul says, you know, I wrote you with many tears and sorrow when I heard that that was going on. That hurt me. He says, now, if I cause sorrow, if anyone, he said, had caused sorrow in verse 5, he caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much, Paul says, but to all of you. You know, that this guy was doing this. Paul said, it didn't just grieve my heart, but I'm sure it, it grieved you guys all too. Now, Paul says in verse 6, sufficient for the one, such a one, is the punishment which was inflicted on him by the majority. So that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, such a such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. For to this end, I also wrote, so that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. Paul says, you guys, you, you put the guy out. Then Paul heard that the man repented. Guess what? They weren't letting him back in. Because like any good Christian, once that person has a strike against them, they're out. 
And it's not three strikes you're out. It's whatever strike and you're out. And I hate to tell you this, but there are some churches that operate on the, I call the First Corinthian principle. First, uh, First Corinthians put them out when they get in sin. But what about when they repent? The Second Corinthian suggestion is what? Reaffirm your love for that person. Bring them back. The whole idea of mourning over someone when they're in sin, that you see that death that's coming, oh, I'm, that, that breaks my heart, I mourn over that, is that it, it, it hopefully is a catalyst to wake them up, to spiritually gib-slap them into a, a soberness of, whoa, I'm really doing something wrong. They, they put me out of the church. You know, I, maybe I'm blind. And, you know, it's a wake-up call. But when they wake up, what do you do? I, I hate to tell you this, but Christians are terrible about this. You know, like, so what, if they, what if they're like the prodigal son? They went off into sin willfully, took dad's inheritance, their portion, and blew it. Did all the sinning they could and came to the realization at the end, wow, this stinks. My, my father's servants have it better. I'm going to go back and repent and ask my father to forgive me. Just let me be a slave. I'm not even worthy to be a son. Just can I work for you? Now, what was the father's response when he saw his son coming? Kill the fatted calf. Kill the fatted calf, took his best robe, put it on his son, his ring, said, this son, which was dead, is now what? Alive. He had a party. He rejoiced. The prodigal has returned. You know, I wish churches, we, we need to have more prodigal parties. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's the truth. When, when somebody who's been a prodigal comes back, we should go, woo! It's so great. You're back from the dead, spiritually. You're back to life. Is Come back. Give, come here. Give them a hug. Reaffirm your love for them because you're happy that they're back out of that darkness and coming back to the light. But you know what churches do. We have these, we call them pious, self-righteous folks. I don't know why they congregate at churches. I wish they wouldn't. They kind of wreck it for the rest of us. These people that go and they're just like, they, they remind me of the older brother. Remember the story of the prodigal? How the older brother was like, man, uh, he, was, he was ticked that, that, that dad killed the fatted calf for the brother who blew everything. He's like, I've been faithful. I've been with you this whole time. You never killed a calf for me. You never had a party for me. And the father said, but I had to. This son, of, this son was dead. Now he's alive. And he said to the one who had been faithful, the older one that had stayed, he said, all that I have, it belongs to you, son. It's all yours. You know, why are you, why are you getting all tweaked out about this? Y you already get all the stuff. But don't you see he was dead? And when we see people in sin and God is wooing them back to himself, unfortunately, Christians don't have the same attitude as the father. They're like, well, you sinned, you are sucking mud, you deserve it. And don't come in our church. Because we're the righteous. We didn't, we didn't go out and blow it. You did. No prodigals welcome here. Now, would churches actually put that on their door as a statement? No, but they will live it in their attitudes when the prodigal returns. You don't think so? You see some of those churches are all... Well, we don't really qualify because we don't have a dress code quite as strict as some of the mainland. I mean, look around. <laughs> the pastor's wearing shorts. You know, I wouldn't be allowed in some churches on the mainland the way I dress here, but I'm the most gussied up one just for you watching on the video. This is like formal wear in Hawaii. I have button up shirt, collar, you know, this is, this is shoes. I got shoes on. Chance is holy shoes. I've had these for, I brought these from Arizona. 26 years they've lasted me. Got them resold twice to make it this far, but then I noticed a new hole this week. <laughs> they slip us. Whatever. You know, unfortunately, if you went to the mainland in some of the churches, I've actually seen it happen where people are turned away at the door. You're not dressed properly to join us. Maybe the man uh, doesn't have nice clothes and... He just comes, you know, God, by the way, God doesn't give a rip what you wear. It's not the outward. You can't impress him with the outward. God looks at the heart. But 
I hate to tell you this, but within Christianity, there are some Christian circles that have adopted that self-righteous attitude of the of the older brother who stayed and they they don't they, they might as well just put it on their door no prodigal parties here no prodigal sons are allowed to return here go somewhere else now i hope that you understand if they come here we're gonna have a party we're gonna say praise the lord you're back from the dead you're back to walk in life that's a great thing that is, that we rejoice over that. You know, the Bible tells us that the angels of heaven rejoice more over one sinner who repents than the 99 righteous that stayed. And who taught me that anyway? Where did I read that? Let me think. I think that would be Jesus. When he said that the good shepherd would leave the 99 and go after the one, that one of the flock that has strayed away and he'll go and get that one and rescue it. The heart of the father is, let's look after the one that is, that's going the wrong way. Because that way is leading to death. And that's not the will of God. God's will is that none should perish. Not that just the good ones that stayed in the flock make it in. But even the ones that wandered. And how many times have we been the one that wandered? How many times have we needed God to re-corral us? back to the flock to redirect us from maybe we're venturing and, and wandering off and he's going back this way come back this way get back into the flock and put us back where we need to be because you know we should be having prodigal parties rejoicing that the prodigal has returned come on let's have a party now i wish that you know i really wish sometimes that we do it like you know some guy comes back and we go it's a party day He's back from the dead. But the church at Corinth was like, we ain't letting him back in the group. That's what they were doing. They had, they had followed the first instructions so well that they're like, we're not going to mess up on this one. Paul said put him out. We put him out. Paul has to write 2 Corinthians just to say, okay, you did a good job. But lest he be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow, you should, verse 8, reaffirm your love for him. You need to say, hey, we love you. We still love you. We just didn't want you to get swallowed up by death. We, want, we didn't want you to be stuck in sin. Come back here. For this, to this end, verse 9, he says of 2 Corinthians 2, I wrote to you that I might put you to the test whether you would be obedient in all things. You were obedient in putting the guy out. Now let's see, will you be obedient in bringing him back? In verse 10, he writes, But the one you forgive, anything, he says, whom you forgive, I forgive also. And if indeed what I have forgiven, if I've forgiven anything, Paul says, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan. For we, he says, are not ignorant of his schemes. Now, I have news for you. Today's Christian circle has a lot of ignorant Christians. I say this because, well, I got it right here. Paul said that, that guys, we have to forgive. Because if we don't forgive, we're giving an advantage to Satan. And I don't know about you, but I don't want him to have any advantage over me. Forget it. That jerk, he doesn't deserve a single advantage. But one of the things the devil can use to get an advantage over Christians is get them to walk in unforgiveness. If you don't want to walk in forgiveness, the devil goes, I got you now. I got the advantage over you. In fact, Paul says, for we're not ignorant of his schemes. The devil's schemes are to get us to walk in unforgiveness. If he can get us, I mean, we could be saying, but I'm saved, I believe in Jesus, but I just can't forgive that person over there. How much spiritual danger is that that we don't forgive? You guys remember the Lord's Prayer, right? Matthew 6, when Jesus said, you know, they said, teach us to pray. And he said, pray in this manner, our Father which art in heaven. If you're raised a good Catholic boy like me, you know this one by rote. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, the kingdom of heaven will be done. We do it really fast because you got to do it like a bunch of times for penance. But there's a part in that prayer where you pray, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that 
trespass against us. Or if you have a more modern translation, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.